everyone. So before I get started, I just wanted to mention, um, I'm sorry, you might have noticed in the last video that the audio kind of was a little muffled at times. Um, so I got a new laptop slash tablet recently, and mostly it's been working really well for this, but I've realized that the, um, the microphone is just very sensitive. So if I like turn my head at all while I'm making the video, um, it starts to lose my uh, capturing my voice. So um, I'm gonna do my best to, to keep that in mind. I might look into getting like an external microphone because um, that's kind of a bummer to not be able to turn my head. Um, but yeah, sorry if that happens again, but hopefully, you know, I think I repeat myself a lot while I'm uh, while I'm talking and I write most of the stuff down as well. So hopefully that wasn't too bad on the other video. Okay, so um, in yesterday's video, we were talking about um, finding, approximating a secant line or the slope of a, sorry, the slope of a tangent line using secant lines. So, yesterday's video, we were approximating the slope of a tangent line. Um, using secant lines. And specifically, we're, we're using these secant lines where we were bringing the second point closer and closer to the first point. So we are working with this slope of a secant line that looks like this, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So if you think about it, if you have a function and you're trying to find the slope of a tangent line, let's say you're trying to find the slope of the tangent line um, here. So let's say that this is our point A. Um, the tangent line looks like this, right? It's like just kind of barely touching the graph. And the way that we went about doing that uh, or approximating the slope of the tangent line is we took another point B and we move that point closer and closer to A so that our secant lines got closer and closer to looking like the tangent line. So if you think about it, like really what we're ideally looking for, it's almost like we're trying to find the secant line between A and A, right? Like we're trying to get B as close to A as possible. The problem is it would not work if we tried to plug in the same number for both, right? If we tried to do like the secant line from A to A, what would go wrong here? Well, we'd have this, we'd have zero divided by zero, right? We would have something that's undefined when we try to do the slope. So why am I bringing this up? Because the idea that we were using to do that was really this idea of kind of like, instead of plugging in a number directly, we we're kind of like plugging in numbers close to that number. And that's exactly the idea that we're going to get into today, which is called a limit. So we're going to kind of leave this idea of secant and tangent lines behind and you really want to like forget about them for now we're going to come back to them but I think if you're thinking too much about secant and tangent lines in this next section I think it's actually going to really confuse you so forget about secant lines forget about tangent lines we'll come back to them um, but the idea that I want you to just keep in mind was this idea of just like plugging in a bunch of points that are getting closer and closer to something because that's what we're going to be doing in this section so today We're basically going to, again, like I said, leave secant and tangent lines behind, um, but we're going to continue with the idea of plugging in numbers closer and closer. to a specific number. So this is um, the idea behind limits. 
So I will define what a limit is for you in a little bit, but I think before, I think rather than giving you the definition right away, I think it's better to start with an example. And so we'll look at an example and, and use that to kind of understand what the idea of a limit is, and then I'll give you the official definition. So, okay, so let's say that we have a function. And our function is going to be x squared minus 5x plus 6 divided by x minus 3. So we're not doing anything with t tangent lines, secant lines, nothing like that. We're just going to be thinking about this function on its own, not thinking about rates of change, just thinking about like what this function, what its graph looks like, what happens when we plug in different numbers. Okay, so... Um, this function is undefined when x is equal to 3, right? So if you wanted to plug in 3, it wouldn't work. So f of x is undefined when x is equal to 3. So we cannot plug in to this function. This, if you tried to plug in 3, you would get does not exist. You, in this case, you would specifically get 0 over 0, which is not a defined number. So let's say that we wanted to get an idea of what the graph of this function looked like, and we wanted to know what's going on at 3. So you might remember uh, from pre-calculus, there are like two different types of things that can happen with rational functions. There's holes and vertical asymptotes. And so let's say you wanted to know like what's going on is this does this graph have a hole does it have a vertical asymptote like what is the shape of the graph doing um, when we're close to three um, so what we're going to do is instead of plugging in three which we obviously can't because we would get something undefined we're going to instead plug in numbers that are close to three we're going to kind of poke around instead of getting directly to three we'll just do things as close as we can get um, so let me just write that down so we We can figure out what f of x looks like or what it like behaves like close to 3 by plugging in numbers close to but not equal to 3. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a table and, um, and plug in some numbers and see what we get. Okay, so x, we have f of x. So we're going to plug in um, 2.9. 2.99 and 2.999. Those are all numbers that are just below 3, right, and getting closer and closer to 3. Like 2.9 is a little further from 3, 2.99 is closer, 2.999 is even closer. And so then I'm going to put 3 on the table just as like a placeholder, even though we know that it's going to be undefined there. And then um, we can do just a little bit above 3, so like 3.001. 3.01 and 3.1. Okay, so I will save you the effort of plugging these into a calculator. I'm just going to write out what you would get. So just to be clear, how would you actually fill out this table? Literally, you could plug these numbers into this function. So if we plug in 2.9, you're going to get 0 0.9. If you plug in 2.99, you're going to get 0 0.99. If you plug in 2.999, you get 0 0.999. If you try to plug in 3, it's undefined, right? So I'm just going to write undefined. If you plug in 3.001, you get 1.001. .001. If you plug in 3.01, you get 1.01, .01, and 3.1 gives you 1.1. .1. And they're not always going to work out just like this. Like, you know, you might notice how the decimals are all kind of the same. That's just kind of, a, I wouldn't say it's a coincidence, but it has to do with this specific function. 
Okay, so what is going on here? So notice that if we look at the, the X values we're plugging in, so if we look at what's going on here, we have X is getting closer. Let me write it like this. As X approaches 3, right, from both directions, we're getting closer and closer to 3. So if we're looking at what happens as x is getting closer to 3, f of x is getting closer and closer to 1 from both directions, right? And we'll get into that directions thing in a little bit. But So what do I mean by approaches? I mean like, so 2.9, like we said, is pretty close to 3, but 2.99 is even closer. And 2.999 is even closer. So we're plugging in numbers that are getting closer and closer to 3. And then when we look at the outputs, those outputs are getting closer and closer to 1. And then notice I drew the arrows the other direction because like 3.1 is further away from 3 than 3.01. And then 3.001 is even closer. So the arrow would have to go the other way for that. And then similarly, we see that the outputs for f of x, those are also getting closer and closer to 1. So when something like this happens, when, when you try numbers and those numbers are getting closer and closer to a particular x value, and your outputs get closer and closer to a particular output value, um, we can express that as something called a limit. So I'm going to write that down. And then again, I'll, I'll give you a more general definition in a few minutes. But um, if we wanted to write this as a limit, you would write LIM. So that's abbreviation for limit. And then you would say X and you'd put a little arrow and three below the limit part. And then you would say you would write your function. So that's your function, and then you would say equals, and then the right-hand side, or what you're saying that it's equal to, is the output value that it was approaching. And so how would you read this out loud? You would say the limit as x approaches 3 of this function, f of x is equal to x squared minus 5x plus 6 over x minus 3 is equal to 1. That's how you would like say that out loud. Okay, so I want to show you what the graph of this looks like just to kind of give you, connect it, connect what we did with numbers to what's going on in the graph. And then we'll come back and do a, a more general definition and then another couple of examples. So here in Desmos, I have the graph pulled up of, of this function. So if you remember some stuff from pre-calculus, you might have been able to figure out what this graph looks like. Um, but it has a hole in it at uh, an x value of 3. And by the way, just so because on your worksheet, I ask you to graph some of these yourself. Um, just so you know, if you graph a, a, a function that has a hole in it, it doesn't automatically show you the hole like that. I had to put that in extra. So let me take that off for a second. Um, you can figure out whether there's a hole in a function just by tracing along it. So if you trace along it, and then I have to be careful here, right when I hit 3, Notice it says, oops, three, and then it says undefined, and it gives you that whole symbol. But it doesn't actually automatically show you that, so I usually just kind of add that in as a point to, um, to emphasize it. Okay, so what do we see going on in this graph? Well, we see that, like we saw on the table, when you're plugging in x values that are getting closer and closer to three, the y values are going to get closer and closer to one. And then similarly with values that are just above. So if you plug in x values that are uh, just above 3 and getting closer and closer to 3, the y values are going to get closer and closer to 1. Um, and by the way, you can actually do this on, so, you know, I would recommend that make sure you know how to at least type things into a, a calculator. But if you're looking for a shortcut for like, if you're trying to make a table like the one that we just did here, so this this table, it would kind of take you a while to type 2.9, all those things into this function, right? That's kind of like a complicated function to type things into. Um, so a quicker way to do it 
is if you go to Desmos, if you do, if you write down your function as a function, so f of x is equal to whatever, um, then you can actually just type in something like, so let's see. If I type in um, f of 2.9, Not supposed to be a lowercase f. Okay, hopefully that will work now. So f of 2.9, notice it tells me it's equal to 0.9. So once you've defined your function in Desmos, you can just like do f of 2.9, then you could do 2.99, etc., cetera, um, so that you can get those numbers out with have it, without having to type them in um, to a calculator, which is kind of clunky. Okay, so let me write down a general definition for you. So in general, the limit as x approaches a of a function, f of x, is equal to a number l. And then we'll see that, that the, the, the limit could also be equal to either positive or negative infinity. So we'll see those in, in a minute. Um, if as x approaches a f of x let me i know my i've noticed my writing is like slowly tilting upwards La, last quarter in my videos i i used a background that had like um graph paper on it so that it kept my handwriting neater but i thought it looked a little bit cleaner without it but i might need to go back to that because i just have this tendency to <clears throat> try to make my writing go up all the time so if as x approaches a um, f of x approaches l. So meaning that when I say f of x approaches l, I mean the y values, right? The output values of your function approach a particular number. So in our previous example, x was approaching 3, the y values were approaching 1. So that's why we said that the limit as x approaches 3 of this function was equal to 1. Um, and then the way that you read this out loud, let me just write that down as well, like we did on the other one, say the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l. Okay, so let's do another example. Um, we'll see that something uh, something new or a couple new things are going to come up in this example. So this time, let's let our function be called g of x. And it's going to look a lot like the function that we were just working with, but the denominator is going to be different. So numerator is still going to be x squared minus 5x um, plus 6. And we're basically, we're, we're going to try to figure out the limit. We'll see that there's a couple of new things that are going to come up. So I'm just going to write it this way. I'm going to say, um, what happens to g of x when x is close to 1? Right, because x, we can't plug in 1 for x, right, because that would make this function undefined, because we would be dividing by 0. Um, so what we're going to do instead is exactly what we did on the last example. We're going to make a table. And again, if you remember stuff from pre-calc about, like, vertical asymptotes and, and poles, you might be able to kind of figure this out. But um, in general, in this class, I, I don't really want you to be relying on the rules that you might have learned in pre-calculus. I really want you to be using limits to, to figure stuff out about what the graph looks like. Okay, so let's do, so this time we're trying to figure out, or we're trying to plug in values that are close to 1. So that could be things like 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, and then I'll put 1 in just as like a placeholder. Then we could do 1.001, 1.01, and 1.1. So if you plug these in, um, according to what I found, you get negative 23.1 when you plug in 
0.9, you get negative uh, 203.01. When you plug in 0.99, you get negative 2003.001. When you plug in um, 0.999, so you can't plug in one, so that's undefined. Um, when you plug in 1.001, you get 1,997.001. When you plug in 1.01, you get 197.01. Kind of cool the patterns that come out of this, huh? And then for uh, the last one, you get 17.1. Okay, so let's think about what's happening in this case. So for this one, notice that as x is getting closer to 1, so I'll write that over here. So as x approaches 1, and there's something we're going to add in there, but I'll come back to that. So as x approaches 1, and we're looking at these numbers that are a little bit less than 1, um, basically what's happening is that your outputs are getting smaller and smaller, right? They're becoming more and more negative. So the way that I'm going to express that is I'm going to say g of x approaches negative infinity. So infinity, negative infinity, those aren't numbers, but what, what do I mean when I say approaches negative infinity? I mean that our results are getting more and more negative. So the closer our inputs get to one, the more and more negative the outputs are going to be. So if we did 0.9999, you would get an even more negative answer. And so what we see happening on the other side, if we're looking at the numbers that are just above one, we see that as x approaches 1, in this case, now our outputs are actually getting bigger and bigger. So we would, in this case, we would say g of x approaches positive infinity. So again, we saw that something slightly different was happening with the numbers at the top and the numbers at the bottom. So the way that we're going to describe that is for the first one, we're going to say as x approaches 1 from the left. And for the second one, we're going to say as x approaches 1 from the right. So why am I saying that? Well, basically, if you were to um, draw like a number line. Everything's always tilting up. Okay. If you were to draw a number line, and let's say you put, you know, one on your number line, well, all of the numbers that we're plugging in, like 0 0.9, let's say 0 0.9 is there, 0 0.999, 0 .9, those are all on the left side of one, right? So that's why we're saying as x approaches one from the left. Whereas the numbers like 1.1, 1.01, 1 1.001, those are all on the right side of 1. So that's why we say from the right and from the left. So in this case, we actually would write down the limits with a little bit of new notation added in. So we would write the limit as x approaches 1, and then I'm going to put this little, like it's like an exponent, but the exponent is a negative sign. And so that little negative sign represents the fact it's not negative one. It, that negative sign means that we're approaching from the left. So as x approaches one from the left of um, this function, so you can write out the whole function. I'm just going to write g of x because we, we know that g of x is equal to this whole function. But if you wanted to, you could also write the whole function in there um, rather than writing g of x. So based on what we found, we found that the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of g of x is equal to negative infinity. So let me make a note of that. So that negative sign was the part that means from the left. And then the other example, or the other side, we found that um, as you approach 1 from the right, so if you put a little exponent that looks like a plus sign, this means from the right. So from the right, the limit 
came out to be positive infinity. So if the left hand and the right hand limit are not equal to each other, you actually say that the limit does not exist. And I'll write that out as a more uh, general fact in a second. Um, but because basically because the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of g of x was not the same thing as the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of g of x. If you just write the limit as x approaches 1 without any plus or minus, that implies that it has to agree on both sides. So I shouldn't even put an equal sign here. You would just say does not exist. And I might use this sometimes, and you're welcome to. You can write DNE as an abbreviation for does not exist. So going back to the, the, the first example we did, so on this one, they did agree, right? Like we didn't talk about the left and the right, but, but it didn't matter because it was the same, right? From the, the first part was from the left. So this was from the left. The second part was from the right. And we got the same answer both way from or both ways, right? From the left and from the right, it approached one. And so that's why in this case, the limit did exist. It did equal one. Whereas on the example we just did now, individually, the left hand and the right hand limit, so that's what these are called, the left hand and the right hand limit, um, those individually existed. We got answers for both of those, but they didn't agree. So when you try to put them together, overall, you say the limit does not exist. So I'll write that down as a general fact. So in general, so like we said before, the limit as x approaches a with a little negative sign of a function is equal to L if as x approaches A from the left. And just to be really explicit, what do we mean when we say approaches A from the left? We mean that um, X gets closer to A while being less than A. So that's what we mean when we say from the left. Um, if as you approach from the left, if the function, if the output values get closer and closer to a number L or get closer and closer to infinity or negative infinity, um, then we would say that the, the left hand limit, um, is equal to L. And so let me just write down a similar one for, from the right. So if x approaches a from the right, so what does it mean from the right? It means x gets closer to a while always staying greater than Um, f of x approaches L. And I hope I'm, I might be getting near the place where the screen cuts off, so let me move that over a little bit. Um, so let me just write down something I quickly mentioned, which is that um, the, the first one here, this is what's called a left-hand limit. And this one is called a right-hand limit. And then another important fact that we just said, um, or that we saw in the last example, is that if the limit as x approaches a from the left is not equal to the limit as x approaches a from the right, 
um, then if you just write the limit without any plus or minus, that does not exist. So in order for a limit to exist, it needs to be the case that from the left and from the right, you get the same thing. Um, okay, I wanna, I forgot to show you the graph for the second one, so let's, let's look at that. Um, so the second example we did, so that was x squared minus 5x plus 6 over x minus 1. So this one, we were looking at the limit as we approached um, 1. And basically, we saw that if you plugged in numbers that were just less than 1, the, the y values, the outputs, got smaller and smaller. So that's what causes us to have a vertical asymptote where it goes down and down and down on the left side. And then when we plugged in numbers that were just a little bit above 1, we got higher and higher and higher output values. And so that's why the function has a vertical asymptote that goes up um, on the right side of 1. Okay, I want to do one more quick example. And sorry, this I know I said 20 to 30 minutes for these videos, and I've had a hard time sticking to that. But um, one last example. So we're going to find the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over x squared. So any time from here on out where, where you're evaluating a limit, you want to start by evaluating the left and the right-hand side and make sure before you give a final answer, you have to decide whether those agree or not. So if it turns out that they don't agree, your answer is always does not exist. Doesn't matter what you got on those two left and right. If they don't agree with each other, the, the limit just straight up does not exist. Okay, so let's do the same as we did um, the other ones. So maybe let's call this one maybe some x. Okay, so um, if we're doing the limit as x parts is 0, so if we're doing numbers that are just below 0, those should be negative, right? So we're going to do something like negative 0.1, negative 0.01, and negative 0.001. And then 0 is going to be does not exist. And then um, just above zero would be things like positive 0 0.001, positive 0 0.01, and positive 0 0.1. Okay, so um, if we plug in, so one thing I just want you to notice is that our denominator is x squared. So we're actually going to get the same results when we're plugging in the, um, the negative numbers as when we plug in the positive numbers. Okay, so if we plug in negative 0.1, and I just realized that I forgot to fill this table out ahead of time, I believe. So I'm going to do these in my head. Hopefully I will get them okay. So if we plug in negative 0.1 and we square that, so that's 1 tenth, so that should be 100. So I believe we're going to get 100 as our output for this one. So this one, I think we're going to get 10,000. Hopefully I'm right on these. If not, I apologize. Um, and then this one, when we square it, I think we should get, so that's 1,000th. So I think this one will be, let's see, that's six zeros, I think. I think this will be a million. If these numbers are not quite correct, the idea is at least correct of, of what's the, where they're heading. Um, so you can't plug in zero, so this one is undefined. Um, then, like I said, because you're squaring these numbers, you're going to get the same result. So when you plug in positive 0 0.001, you'll get the same thing as plugging in um, negative 0 0.001. And... Same thing here, and then same thing here. Okay, so in this case, notice that as we're approaching, so as x approaches 0 from the left, h of x is getting bigger and bigger, right? So we can say h of x 
approaches infinity. And as x approaches zero from the right, we also see that h of x approaches infinity. So what can we say from this? Well, we can say that the limit as x approaches um, zero from the left of h of x is equal to infinity. Then we also know that the limit as x approaches zero from the right of h of x is equal to infinity. And so because those two agree, that's what allows us to say that, so let me write this down as a sentence, the left and right hand limits agree. So the limit as x approaches 0 without a right or a left, just on its own, of h of x is also equal to infinity. So I just want to quickly look at the graph of that one and kind of contrast it with the, the previous one we did. So the previous one we did had a vertical asymptote at 1, right? And But the difference with that one is that on, on that one, the graph was going down on one side and, and up on the other. Whereas for this function, it also has a vertical asymptote, but this one, it's having the same behavior on both sides. So because it's doing the same thing on both sides, we can say that the limit equals infinity. Whereas on the other one, because it was doing something different on both sides, we had to say the limit does not exist. All right, so that's it for today. Um, so your worksheet for today will basically just uh, have you practice doing this for a few different functions. So making sure that you know which numbers to pick and, and you can fill out the table. Um, feel free to use the shortcut like I showed you on Desmos rather than type a gajillion things into the calculator. Um, but please do also look at the graphs on Desmos. I think it's a really good idea to, to both be able to look at the numbers and also be able to look at the graph and kind of make that connection between the two. All right, thank you, and um, I will see you in tomorrow's video.